All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is 12 o'clock straight up, according to my computer, so I'm gonna call this uh, work session of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees to order. We're gonna start with our roll call, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam President. President Taylor. I'm here. Vice President Cuddell. Here. I am here. <clears throat> Trustee Calvert. Here. Trustee Church. Here. Trustee Nicolette. Here. Trustee Thigpen. He's having an internet issue, so he'll jump on when he can. And our student representative isn't here, of course. We have a quorum, Madam. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. We're gonna ask, Vanji, since you're standing, we're gonna ask Vanji to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering by standing up, Vanji. <laughs> Thank you, Vanjie. Okay, we'll start. Any public comment as we begin, JJ? Richard Davis. All right, sir, come on up. Take your time, just right here to the podium. Absolutely, you can sit right there. Thank you. That's better for you? Absolutely. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for keeping. Can I take my mask off the top? No, I'm sorry, sir. You got to keep that on if you would. Thank you. And if you, if you can slide that over your nose, that would be even better. Awesome. Thank you. It goes down when I talk. I understand. All right. Uh, my name's Richard Davis. I'm a resident of Sparks. I live with my wife, Sharon, who is a retired school teacher from Torrance, California. And before COVID hit, she was also a, uh, a substitute teacher here in Washoe County. And, uh, excuse me while I take, get my breath. It's okay, take your time. We have some significant concerns about the social justice curriculum that's being under consideration. And uh, we find it to be, number one, confusing. Number two, definitely not age appropriate uh, for kindergartners to fifth graders. And number three, it's divisive in nature. And uh, starting off, you know, actually, what, what actually is social justice? It's a very nebulous term. And how does it differ from the legal justice system that's outlined in our Constitution, its amendments, and, and our laws? Uh, all that, we can, as, as citizens or anybody else, can go and research that and find it in black and white what our rights are and, and so forth. On the other hand, social justice, you, it's, you can't do that. There's no definition that I could find. Well, nothing specified in terms of what these rights are. Uh, they do have a, a definition that they included in the uh, a curriculum. And I'm just going to quote that. It says, social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. Now that sounds quite noble, but what does it mean actually? You know, as I said, I couldn't find anywhere where it's really defined. And so, but what it boils down to, it says it's a view, therefore it's, it's an opinion. It's somebody's opinion as to what these social rights are. And they're not defined, so basically it just boils down to whatever somebody wants to claim they are. And there's a lot of that going around. But in order to add validity to these claims, first you have to call into 
question the adequacy of our existing system. You know, and they they do that. Does that mean? No, you have 30 more seconds, so you go ahead. Can and I, I give you the, hmm? oh, is that it? I missed the 30 seconds? Okay. Good. If you can just wrap up real quick, just one, one uh, statement you can wrap up. And... Well, I didn't even get into it. I mean, okay. this, this this takes a okay. lot more than three minutes. I'm sorry, Thank sir. That's, that, that's that's what we have is, is three minutes. You can't give me extra time. We cannot. No, sir. Um, I pre your time is up, sir. I appreciate it, Mr. Okay. Davis. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to come down. Those are all the cards I have. Thank you, JJ. Okay, so now we'll jump into the meat of the agenda for the work session uh, for today. We'll start with uh, 1.05, uh, action to adopt the agenda. Uh, looking for a, a motion, if it's the pleasure of the board. Moved. Moved by Vice President Caldwell. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Clerk Manetto. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Opposition? The motion is carried. Let the record show it is unanimous. That is 6-0 right now. That's for you, Vice President Caldwell. Okay. Uh, uh, agenda is adopted, so we'll jump into 2.01. Uh, this is uh, approval for the uh, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER II, as it's known by under the Coronavirus Response and Relief uh, Supplemental Appropriations Act, CRSA. This is for $34,386,079. This is for possible action. And before us is a director, or our director of grants, Laura Olin. Thank you for being here. There we go. <clears throat> Good afternoon, um, President Taylor and Superintendent McNeil and board members for the record. My name is Laura Olin. I'm the director of grants. And I'm here today to talk to you about our application for the Corona Response and Relief Supplemental Appro Appropriations, which is a mouthful. And we, we shorten that by calling it CRESA, the CRESA Act, which um, funds both ESSER II and um, GEAR II. Okay. My, okay. So, <clears throat> Nevada was awarded $477 million um, under this act, of which 90% or $429 million must be allocated directly to the LEAs or Nevada school districts using the um, school, using school year um, 2021 Title I um, allocation formula. So Washoe County share for ESSER II is $34 million. $368,079. All these funds must be expended by September 30th of 2023. Am I doing okay? Oh, thanks. Okay, good. I could always use some help clicking. It's hard to click and talk at the same time sometimes. Um, so ESSER 2 is very similar to ESSER 1. Um, where it's still carrying on with um, actually um, resources in response to the pandemic, but then we start to see a slight move into more recovery. So you'll see the first two bullets there. Addressing learning loss, that's new under ESSER 2. It wasn't necessarily under ESSER 1. And then addressing school facilities, repairs, and um, improvements. Those were both new categories under ESSER 2. Um, you'll still see um, the other needs that were also included in ESSER 1, and that includes addressing the unique needs of special populations, um, purchasing um, education technology, and any activity authorized under SEA, IDA, McKinney-Ventos, or the Perkins Act. Okay, thanks. Um, also, um, funds can be used for coordinating with state, local, and other efforts to prepare um, and prevent and respond to COVID-19, providing SEL and mental health services, providing summer learning and supplemental after-school programming, conducting other activities necessary to maintain operational services. 
So the next slide, oh, there's still a couple more. Yeah, it is a laundry list. Um, um, I'll, I, you can go to the next one, JJ, thanks. Also, PPE is also allowable. Um, any procedures to improve school preparedness and response systems, administ administrative expenses that are necessary are allowable, and of course, indirect costs. Thank you. So here's what we've spent the bulk of our money on under ESSER II. Um, the most of it, the majority of our 34 million is being used to address learning loss, uh, addressing the unique needs of disadvantaged students, activities outlined in IDA, McKinney Vento, Perkins, and also providing extended learning opportunities. So under these categories, we are spending approximately $21.9 million. And I just wanted to illustrate a couple programs that we're doing. The first one um, is called the RALLY grant, which stands for Reengagement and Accelerated Learning for Local Youth. And uh, my, our dear friend Ben Hayes actually came up with that acronym. And this is for our middle and high schools. And we gave each middle and high school um, an FTE according to how many um, students they have in their school. So. Um, lowest enrollment schools got one FTE up to our highest enrollment schools that received four FTEs. And then these principals were able to pick between um, the categories of learning loss and social emotional learning. So example, um, um, schools picked um, more core instruction teachers to lower class size, more intervention teachers social workers, counselors, things like that. So that's what the rally grant is about. <clears throat> the building learning facilitators um, positions are for our elementary schools. And as you recall, this is, um, a, this is an outgrowth from Read by Grade 3, where we had learning strategists in our school buildings at all our elementary schools that help teachers um, model really good um, instruction, um, intervention instruction for LEA. This is expanded a little more. Not only is it looking at LEA instruction and intervention for students, but also in mathematics. And then also tutoring and long-term subs for um, interventions. You wanna give it to me? Okay. <laughs> okay, also under this category, we have extended day summer school, uh, of which we have 3.6 million uh, planned in this grant to support our summer school. We have EL and GATE teachers, a CIT liaison, and we have web-based intervention programs in both LEA and mathematics, K through eighth grade. And then we also have middle school orientation. Our, we heard from our middle school principals and they said that they really wanted to get their middle schoolers back into school and feeling welcomed, especially those that were distance learners. And also um, because um, middle school, as like high school, was one day on in in-person instruction and then one day distance learning. So the majority of our middle school principals said, hey, we want to do an orientation this year to welcome our middle schoolers back to school. Uh, the next area that we're spending money on is in social emotional learning. This is approximately $3 million. And in this area, we're supporting a crisis counselor, re-engagement specialist, attendance officer, MTSS learning strategist, and then other SEL positions to be specified at a later date. The third area we're addressing is learning loss as it pertains to resources for families to better, to better support their students. And in this area, we're spending approximately $141,000. We do have a IT help desk uh, person that is just there for families. This was started with our um, ESSER 1 when we realized that families really needed support with technology. and. Um, just for grins, I found out that that person, since um, he or she, I don't know if it's a he or she has been hired, has fielded over 320 calls um, just in the spring semester. And then also a family resource center specialist. Um, then the next area we have is conducting activities necessary to maintain operations in approximately $6.1 million. 
is being used in this area, and this is really to support our teachers. Uh, the first is 21st century trainers who work with teachers to help them understand how to use technology in their classroom and also for distance learning. Uh, we've also added a mentor teacher for novice elementary um, teachers. I know that you heard at the um, strategic planning meeting last week that we're anticipating a lot of um, employees will be being ready to retire, and we anticipate a lot of new elementary school teachers. So this person will be helping those novice elementary um, teachers. <clears throat> and then a building learning facilitator coordinator. So that goes back to the first slide for learning loss. So there's um, somebody in the elementary school, every single elementary school, and this is a person that is coordinating the training for all those building learning facilitators. And then finally, uh, an allocation bank, and this is to help our schools round up on allocations next fall so that we can um, help out the schools with staffing a little bit more. And then addressing school repairs and maintenance. In this area, we're spending approximately 862000 and this is mainly for PPE. And then the last category is administration and indirect, and this is 1.7 million. I just wanted to point out that indirect cost is the bulk of this at $1,227,419. And then we will also be hiring for a project manager to manage um, both the ESSER II and ESSER III grants because these are such large, large amounts of money, $34 million for ESSER II and then for ESSER three seventy seven million uh, grants department support and then evaluation department support. Lauren, if I can make, can you give us an example of indirect cost for the uh, public that might be listening to right. so what um, does that include? Indirect cost is the allowable cost that we can um, take and it's based on um, overhead for our school district. So this these costs go to the general fund, but they're used to help um, HR and IT and the business department, uh, and so all the supporting departments that um, are used when you're accessing a grant, such as hiring people, doing payroll, things like that. So it's really other expenses that we have because of the grant, right? right. Other, like other, in terms of managing the grant and whatnot, it's other expenses we have as a result of that. Correct, mm -hmm. and it's, it's also, indirect cost is a formula, um, that I'm not going to pretend to really understand that well. Jill Murdoch in our department does that. But then it's uh, indirect cost is always sanctioned by your cognizant agency. In our case, that's Nevada Department of Ed. So they approve that um, cost for us every year. Hovers a little uh, uh, around 3.5% um, a year it fluctuates, but I would say that's probably an average. Thank you, Lorna. Uh, Clerk Vanetto and then Superintendent McNeil. All right, thank you. Uh, so we hire a project manager to manage this huge amount of money. Then what, when, in two years when this money's gone, what happens to that person? Well, <laughs> it's a great <laughs> question. It's part of the funding clip conversation that we have. But all, um, all, all people that are hired under a grant are on a limited term. So when, when they take the position, um, HR is giving them, like it may be a one year only grant. In this, in this case, it would be limited term and it would say that it expires on uh, uh, September 30th, 2024. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Superintendent McNeil. Thank you, Clerk McNeil. So that was a great question because you and I did not have our one-to-one -one. Um, so I put this in our one-to-ones. So the project manager is actually something that the Council of Great City Schools suggests is a best practice because of the amount of compliance, the outward facing um, scrutiny of these federal dollars and the accountability for these dollars. So they really feel that having one kind of clearinghouse type position is the best in the best interest of the school district. And then just you know to Lauren's uh, um, addition as far as um, indirect costs, those dollars go directly into the general fund budget, but it's only for federal grants. We do not take indirect costs off of state grants. So it's only for our federal dollars that we get the indirect costs. Okay. 
And also, we never take indirect on private foundation grants as well. I mean, there's certainly costs to managing grants, so I, I, I absolutely get it. I want to get more so for the public. Trustee Church? An area near and dear to my heart, can you tell me about the CIT liaison, the homeless program? Um, yes, this is under the McKinney-Vento uh, program, and these are staff, and, and they're in six zones, and they go out and they work with the students that are homeless, identified as being homeless, um, and then get services for them, such as make sure that they have transportation to school, they have food, clothing, shelter, any other type of fees that they may need for school, that those are covered for them, uniforms, things like that. And then one more question. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Um, under ESSER 2, it says providing summer learning and supplemental after school programs. I'm a big, big believer in field trips. Would that be covered? And if so, I'll make a comment on that. Uh, so f field trips are being covered in summer school. Uh, right now they're virtual <coughs> field trips, but it is in the summer school budget. Okay. You know, virtual, hopefully we'll get past that because in my visits to the schools, uh, kids, some of them have never seen the ocean. Mm -hmm. Some of them have never seen Lake Tahoe. And uh, I'm just big. If we have any extra funding, if some program comes up under budget or something, I am just so big on field trips to uh, California, let them see the ocean. They could maybe study the Golden Gate Bridge and how it was built. Then they get to see it. Um, you know, just so much between here and there. The California, Sacramento capital, uh, that in Vallejo, Wally World, or whatever it is, maybe give the kids a little break there. And um, I'm a little biased, but they could stop at Travis Air Force Base and see the Air Force Museum. I'm, well, I'm very biased. But anyway, I just wanted to get my plug in for if there's supplemental money, that field trips are just so educational. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Church. I think we all remember having great field trips when we were in school growing up. Lauren? Okay. Just a few more slides. So also under ESSER 2, we give uh, funding to our charter schools. And you can see the seven charter schools that are eligible for funding, and we're giving them just a little under a half a million dollars to those schools. Went too fast. Okay, and then final slide, um, gear two. Uh, Nevada was awarded $31.3 million. $19 million of that is reserved for the emergency assistance non-public schools. Uh, I, if you, may, you might recall under ESSER 1, we had to give some of our money to um, participating non-public schools. The, the law has changed in the favor of the LEAs under uh, ESSER 2, and so the state has to administer those programs for the non-public private schools versus the LEAs, which does take a lot of burden off the LEAs. And then there's a remaining $12 million that's been awarded to the governor's office to use at his discretion on how funds will be distributed. At this time, there's been no guidance for these funds. However, these funds can be given to the LEAs and or also to our institutes of higher education in Nevada. And GEAR 2 funds also must be expended by September 30th, 2023. And that is all I have. Okay. So it looks like there's our report from this is having a lot of feedback. Let, let, I'll go, go to Vice President Caldwell. Thank you, Madam President. Um, on slide 10, where we talk about the 6.1 million, this one, this one I struggle with because when I, when you talk to teachers, the teachers generally, the feedback I've received is, we need more teachers in the classroom. We don't need more teachers trying to train us how to teach, and. And so six million seems like a lot to me, especially with that feedback. And maybe that could go somewhere else that may be more impactful. That that's the feedback that I get from from teachers. I'm just curious if 
So, the district would like to respond to that. Yes, I, I'm happy to. Um, it's actually not that that many FTEs. It's only two FTE um, 21st century trainers, one FTE teacher mentor, and one building uh, facilitator coordinator. The bulk of the money in this category is under the allocation bank, $4.5 million. And that would actually help um, the school buildings because for example, next fall when the allocations come around and a school has 20.5, the allocation bank will let them roll that up to 21 allocations. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. McNeil might be able to explain that a little bit better. <laughs> so, and I can appreciate that. Um, and Lauren is absolutely right. So um, a lot of this is going to the building learning facilitator. And interestingly enough, those building learning facilitators, if you remember when they were under read by grade three, they were strictly uh, for literacy. With the building learning facilitator, we have expanded the approach so that they will be able to assist teachers in literacy and mathematics. And then with the allocation bank, just as Lauren was explaining, um, depending on enrollment, if you remember when our schools opened up, um, there were some concerns with um, social distancing and the number of students that could be in a classroom at the same time. And so we want to make sure that our schools are set up so that this allocation bank would be able to be used if we had to go down that route. And it also helps with our high schools um, not having to reduce numbers um, as far as courses. Thank you. That, that, thank you. Keep going. Yeah, I was, so... What do we, who do we envision being in this allocation bank? Uh, brand new teachers out of college that maybe don't get placed somewhere? Is it just another way to say we have more guest teachers? I'm just kind of curious on who actually is gonna be in that bank. It depends on who, you know, who has the position at that point in time. It's, it's basically an allocation for a school so that they don't have to reduce their allocations. If you remember when we had enrollment last year and we had, um, I can't remember, uh, Deputy Byersdorf, but we had almost like 68 positions that we were going to have to reduce because of uh, lower enrollment. And then these allocations, we were actually able to save positions. So that's really what the intent is, is to save positions. Okay, I, one last follow-up. Uh, some of the principals in my district and visiting the schools, most, uh, most of the concerns that I received around reductions came at the admin level, where um, a principal would be losing an AP in favor of a half-time dean sharing their school. Could a principal use an allocation bank position to get a one FTE as an AP, or is it strictly for teachers? Currently, the allocation is just for certified teachers right now, and then they would take a look at the enrollment and adjust it accordingly, depending on what those student numbers are. So if the student numbers came in higher, then we would take a look at what those, out, those staffing ratios would be for a dean or an AP. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chelsea Kyle. I think we're, we're good. If Bob got up to answer, I think we're good in terms of that. Your question is taken care of, Vice President Cole? Okay, any other questions? This, this is something that would need a motion from the board, if it is the pleasure of my colleagues, to, um, to approve the, uh, the appropriations as outlined by Ms. Olin for this grant. I see you leaning in, Dr. Nicolette, so we'll go to you. You betcha. Thank you very much. Um, I am making a motion uh, that the Board of Trustees approves the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, ESSER II, under the Coronavirus Response and Release Supplemental Appropriations Act, CRESA, uh, for $34,386,079. Thank you, Trustee Nicolette. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Vice President Cardo. Any further discussion? There were great questions of our trustee church. No, I'm sorry. Oh, you're just ready to vote. Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Opposition? The motion aye. is carried. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's, I have to wait for you. Sorry, Kurt. I did, oh, I see you up there now. It's good. I didn't know you had joined us. Yes. So I'm, 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 I'm imagining that as a aye for yes. 
Got your thumbs up. Thank yes. you. I can see that right away. The voice takes a minute, but thumb I got right away. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, so let the record show that it is unanimous seven zip. And and I will just say, um, much like some of the conversation that just happened, I think the allocation bank is really important and can really help our schools. It helps to keep ratios down. It helps to keep people in buildings. They've been working with those buildings and so on. Mm -hmm. Helps keeps to keep them connected and and so on, especially during this time of recovery. So. Great idea, 4.5 million to that. Great idea, whoever came up with that. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you, Ms. Olin. All right, so now we are on uh, agenda item 2.02. .02. This is presentation and discussion of the results of the strategic plan and budget survey for the 2021-22 school year. This is uh, just for presentation, but it's re related to the budget and what what information we got from the community on um, on their input and on the strategic plan and really the budget, which should be a reflection of what we say is important in the strategic plan. So certainly that's here before us. To, uh, again, and we see some regulars in front of us, Dr. Davidson and Ms. Harris, your regulars at the trustees meeting. So welcome ladies, the floor is yours. I'm just gonna turn this right over to Jennifer. All right, good afternoon, um, President Taylor and Superintendent McNeil and esteemed trustees. Uh, so we are going to review the results of the strategic plan and budget survey. Um, the purpose of the survey uh, was to get a sense of the educational priorities of, um, of those who are most connected with our school district. So um, namely students, staff, families, and uh, community members as well. We had a pretty good response rate. Um, over 9,300 people responded to this survey. The survey was open for three weeks, uh, running from April 4th to April 23rd. Um, and again, you can see that we had um, the bulk, bulk of our respondents were representatives of our elementary school, but we also had um, respondents from middle and high schools as well. The groups who responded um, were mostly families of current Washoe County School District students, about 70% of them. Um, and then also we had over a third were school district employees. I wanna call attention to that middle group, which is those respondents who are both, who are both current employees of our school district, but also family members of current students. We think that these people have pretty good insight um, because they are benefiting from the experiences of both those roles. So we wanna call out attention to their responses where possible. Where the survey is lacking is in its representation of Hispanic folks. Um, in fact, um, they are underrepresented by about 28 percentage points. So we wanna make sure that we understand that their voices are somewhat missing from the survey. Um, so a little bit more outreach uh, is needed there to fully understand. This is a struggle that we've had um, and we're, we're really trying to reach out and to make sure that, that those voices are represented in our, our work. Um, also interestingly, um, about 30% of people chose not to divulge their race or ethnicity. This is somewhat unusual for our surveys. Typically, um, people um, will indicate what their race or ethnicity is. Um, this, this survey, they did not. So we don't know who those people, um, which represent or which um, races or ethnicities um, they, they are. So. Whoops, jumping ahead to the good stuff. Here we go. Okay, so um, what you're seeing here then is um, priority areas ranked from highest priority to lowest priority. Um, a highest priority, um, the maximum, uh, it's ranked from one to eight, so eight would be the highest that you, you could receive in each area. So those average rankings are listed on the right side of the graph. 
and they're listed from number one to number eight priorities. So the highest priority area was increasing instructional staff at all schools. That was the top ranked priority. The least ranked priority, or lowest ranked, I should say, priority area was around improving COVID-19 virus mitigation strategies. This shows, um, shows those rankings by respondent group. The gold indicates in, um, a higher prioritized or a higher priority ranking over the average. Red indicates a lower priority ranking compared to the average. So that second column is that special group that I pointed out earlier that include both employees and family members. So you can see um, that they, compared to the average, um, they placed a higher priority on social emotional supports than did the average. That's how you read this. And a lower priority on education technology and a higher priority on professional learning and so on. Um, so in looking at this um, too, I also wanted to call out that student group. So there's very few, I guess, I shouldn't say very few, there's 175 students who did respond to this survey, which is um, not as many as we would like, um, but it's still a very special group for those who responded and they are placing a higher priority on supports for struggling students and social emotional supports um, compared to the average. Additional questions were asked to elicit more detail around each of those priority areas. I won't go in detail on all of these. I just wanted to alert you that they are here um, for you to study on your own time if you would like. All of this information is gonna be made available on our website, of course. Um, and you can reach out to us if you have any questions as well. Um, but this, this, these particular questions I find interesting coming after uh, Lauren Olin's presentation around some of those rally strategies that I think are, um, are reflected here too in the priorities that we found in this survey. Um, they align quite nicely. Our, some of the open comments that came out in the survey around um, staffing, recruiting, developing, and retaining talented staff um, showed us that, that that priority is in part driven by the want uh, for reduced class sizes. Our supports for struggling students, academic opportunities, and education technology um, by far, the highest priority um, that, that, that people expressed in this survey anyways um, were, was that need for supports for struggling students. Um, particularly in comments, we found that, um, that people really want additional support for those who are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, those who may have fallen behind academically over the past year, um, that, that there's a want for individualized supports to meet those needs, um, but also to re-engage, inspire, and get kids really um, wanting to get back to learning. Um, so there, there is a want, a call for that, for strategies to motivate and re-engage. Social, emotional wellness and safety, uh, that's part of that desire to support individual needs. So those who may have disengaged or who have um, things that are pulling them away from learning, um, people would like for, for that to be addressed. Mental wellness, for example, um, and are asking for resources to do just that. That was reflected in the open comments as well. And many people said that 
if there if there are these engaging strategies, if there are smaller class sizes, if there are um, a focus on individualized supports, that emo social and emotional wellness um, will also increase, partially as a result of those strategies. There was a section that asked about how extra learning opportunities, such as summer school, um, for example, could be designed and this slide summarizes what respondents had to say about that. Most respondents said that, um, that we want in-person learning. We want kids to come back together, teachers to come back together, to be in the same environment, the same classroom. But they ask for that structure of that environment to be smaller, um, to be more individualized, and to have course offerings that are practical and hands-on in nature. So this information in these graphs um, show what was just summarized for you. And comments, again, support those summary statements. Um, I, I did find it interesting that some of the examples of the practical hands-on life um, uh, you know, call for um, people want it, want their kids to be able to do things that they can do in everyday life, like change a tire, <laughs> like go to the bank. Um, financial literacy was mentioned um, a lot. So uh, this is all really good feedback and kind of interesting too. <laughs> so staff and employees were asked about their professional learning priorities. Um, and there was some variation between school staff, principals, teachers, um, classified staff. They, they had different ideas as to what should be prioritized. Um, and so we think that this is a really good opportunity for schools to look at their school level reports, which will be made available by the end of this week. Uh, for them to look at their individual reports and to have a conversation about what their school priority, what their needs should be around professional learning. It's a chance for them to all um, come to consensus on that. And again, the, some of that nuanced information will also be captured in the open comments at the school level individual reports. So again, encouraging them to take a hard look at that. Suggestions for school partnerships is uh, for there to be more teacher-parent communication. And then also, um, several people noted that, um, that they, they want to be a part of their children's education, a part of their learning. They want to be informed. They want that increased communication. But they caution to not, to not ask parents to do more um, than what they are uh, capable of doing. Um, not all of them feel that they have the expertise to be instructors. And so they're, they're asking that that be a consideration. And then um, here are some of the big key points, just in summary again. Um, but I want to end by saying that school level reports will be ma made available by the end of the week. Um, Dr. Davidson and myself are always available for questions. And um, all of this data broken down will also be available on our website. And, um, and we're, we're happy to support um, the use of this information if you have questions. All right, thank you. Let's do pause for just a moment here. Uh, Trustee Church, I see you leaning in. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, is this, am I missing anything? Is, is this any different than the one we had on the 21st of May at the pullout? Nope, this is the same data. All righty. And so I'm going to ask the exact same question just so it gets on the record. Nothing in because we were counseled last time about how to interpret data by our PhD uh, professors uh, here, so I got a good lesson in that, and it was a good lesson. Um, nothing in there tells us whether the 
respondents are happy or not happy with the school district, correct? Do you want to? Cor uh, correct. So we did not explicitly ask that question. Um, we are doing a, another survey um, around staff, staff uh, a check-in survey um, that will be coming out this week that will ask that question. All righty. And then also to be clear, nothing in here states whether they want more funding or just live within our means, correct? Correct. All righty. And then the only other thing I really want to emphasize um, to the public and to my fellow trustees on page number eight, it talks about uh, recruiting and retaining high quality teachers as the number one response. I couldn't agree more. I think we really, really need to deep dive into that. So that's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Church. Uh, Trustee Calder? Yes. Um, first of all, I hear sometimes from people why is it important? I have two questions, so I'll sure. do both of them. Why are we teaching our kids social emotional learning? And the second one is a lot of times people are like, well, why are people so dependent on the school for community resources? Uh, I'm happy to help with that question, but I know there are far better experts for this um, besides myself. The social and emotional learning, I would just say that there's a pretty strong evidence base uh, in the literature that supports the use of social and emotional learning to drive instruction or to drive academic achievement. Um, there was a meta-analysis some years ago that demonstrated that across all the studies that have been done on social emotional learning initiatives that there's an 11 percentage point achievement gain among students who had that social emotional learning support. So there's actually a pretty strong research base for social emotional learning. It's one of our higher ESSA evidence levels. Um, and then the question about resources at schools, uh, I'm happy to defer to Dr. McNeil on that one. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Davidson, and great, great answer for the social emotional learning. And so for the community supports, this is really one of the issues, you know, that's on a national level with, with schools. And many of our families um, depend on the resources that schools are able to provide. So whether it's free lunch that we're able to provide, our family resource centers, so whether it's uh, rental assistance, whether it's um, assistance in, um, you know, technology, whether it's um, assistance with, um, the word is leaving me, uh, electricity and <laughs> basic needs. Utilities. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, and then obviously um, hunger. And we know that hunger, um, unfortunately, in our country is an issue. And so just the very basic needs, a lot of our families come to the school to provide to get the resources or to get agencies that can help provide those resources. So the district may not be able to provide. We don't provide actual rental assistance. Um, but we know agencies that can help and guide a family through that process. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. And, and what I often um, tell people, because I think you're right, I, I think all of us in, in some way or another get that question, is it's, it's a part of, you know, many people say, is that, is that a part of our academic mission? But if, if someone is homeless, if someone can't eat, if someone um, doesn't have a, a, um, a stable environment at home, if their family needs some research, it impacts the child's attendance, it impacts their ability to participate, and it impacts their ability to learn. And so that's the connection between that, is it does impact the academic outcomes, and there's research that shows that. It's like uh, transportation. If we don't give kids a ride to school, a lot of kids wouldn't make it. Right, it's that same type of thing. If we don't give them lunch, then a lot of them won't eat. So it's along those same lines. So I, I get that question often and just try to help people see the connection between the two. It's really about the academic outcomes, but if this stuff isn't there, this child is not gonna be able to get to the academic outcomes, so. Okay. Anything else? This, uh, this was a four presentation, as the trustee church said, this is somewhat of a review for us from our uh, work session, but it was related to the strategic plan. So now this related from a budgetary standpoint, which leads us from the strategic plan uh, backdrop um, into the budget part of our meeting. Thank you, ladies. Uh, we, we appreciate you being with us again, Ms. Harris and Dr. Davidson. You're very welcome. Okay, now agenda item 2.03. 
presentation and discussion and public hearings on the fiscal year 21-22 tentative budget for all district funds, update on budget uncertainties, a consideration of possible direction to the superintendent and staff, and possible action to approve the fiscal year 21-22 final budget. This is for possible action and an approval of the 21-22 final budget, just as a reminder, is required by law. That's in statute. And then once the, uh, the legislative session uh, closes, which is coming up soon, we think, uh, we think then there will be a 30-day period um, within which uh, an amendment to that budget, to this budget, um, an amendment to this budget uh, can be submitted based upon whatever realities and uncertainties are resolved. That being said, turn it over to you, our CFO and our budget director. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Madam President, Trustee, Superintendent. You clearly have a very good understanding of the budget process because I was going to go into you, some You've of drilled it. You've drilled it into I'm our glad. heads. That's what I'm, it is. You've I'm, drilled I'm it in our heads. No, I'm very glad for that. Um, as you were saying, um, this final budget in, in odd-numbered years tends to be a little awkward. Um, I would call it a premature final budget, if I can use that word. Um, as you know and just explained, uh, you know, local government's budget processes are, are pretty strictly governed by state law. There are deadlines and dates in state law and regulations and in um, uh, direction provided by the State Department of Taxation. So it is pretty constrained and that creates some awkwardness for uh, in odd numbered years like you were saying. Um, but um, I just wanted to, you know, maybe go a little further in terms of explaining the budget process since I realize this is new or, or perhaps a rehash for several uh, trustees. Um, so again, you know, uh, Chapter 354 of NRS provides a very laid out process for the preparation of state budget, uh, or preparation of local government budgets. Um, as you know, we needed to submit our tentative budget to the State Department of Taxation by April 15th, which we did. And today we need to have a public hearing on that tentative budget. So after our uh, remarks here today, I'll need the president to open up the public hearing for the tentative budget that is set by law to be held in the second half of May, even though it is due to the Department of Taxation on April 15th. The reason why they set that up, that calendar up the way they do is that taxation reviews our budget and has to approve our tentative budget, which they have. They've provided a written letter approving the budget. So we have to conduct that public hearing of the tentative budget today. Then we will consider approval of the final budget today. Um, uh, and unfortunately, just the calendar doesn't line up very well. That final budget has to be submitted to Department of Taxation actually by June 8th. But that doesn't give us much time after the conclusion of the legislative session on May 31st, which you just alluded to, uh, Madam President, to kind of do the analysis we would like to do. So again, what we consider kind of the final budget you've seen um, or are seeing today is to be somewhat premature. As, you, as we'll talk about, we are going through and analyzing a lot of late breaking developments at the legislature, both from last week and even as late as last night. Um, they've taken action on a number of um, bills that affect us. So we will need to go through those bills. And then, um, as you just said, Madam President, we will provide an amended budget, submit that to this board within 30 days of the close of the legislative session. So we've calendared that for June 22nd. So that kind of lays out the process for you. Again, we're pretty strictly governed by statutes in terms of the timeline, even though it is awkward. Um, that all being said, the final budget really is, and, and, and this year the amended final budget will be the culmination of the budget process that we've gone through. Um, and so just to rehash for you and for the public, we really started this budget process in December when we um, had a, you know, a hour to two hour presentation on the new funding formula, the people-centered funding plan. We did that in early December and that kind of set the stage for conversations from here. And then we actually started talking about our budget beginning in January. We've had monthly presentations to you during that time. Um, you've had the ability to raise questions, which you have, or provide commentary or direction to us. Again, in odd numbered years, it's very difficult because the legislature is meeting. And of course, in this process, we have a number of new issues that we've had to face. And those include, of course, COVID-19 and the recession 
that COVID-19 caused. We've got stimulus funding we've had to kind of wrestle with in terms of kind of um, layering that over the general fund budget. And then, of course, there, there is the new funding formula that we'll talk about here shortly um, that will be enacted in the law on July 1st. So we've had to go through, you know, each month kind of a uh, roller coaster ride a little bit in terms of those different issues. I think the board uh, appropriately is kind of laid low in terms of making any massive decisions one way or the other, whether we were talking about partial implementation of the new fun funding formula or full implementation. We've kind of chosen to write it out and see how things turn out, which I think, as it turns out, was very appropriate and prudent. And we'll talk about that more in the amended final budget. Um, one thing before I move on to the actual presentation, though, that I would like to note, and President Taylor noted this on Friday at the work session, but this is the third balanced budget in a row that the districts had. So we had a balanced budget for fiscal year 20, and then we submitted a balanced budget to you for fiscal year 21. And this is a balanced budget, even though it is premature. We've taken pains to balance that budget where revenues equal expenditures in the general fund, and we do not have a deficit. So that's three years in a row and counting. So and let that, me just pause and say, yay! Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Makes your, makes your job a lot okay, easier. You. Yep. So, you know, in terms of our update on state funding, again, it is a rapidly changing updating situation. But you'll recall back in December, the Economic Forum met for the first time, and we were still going through COVID. This was right at the beginning of vaccinations going out. Um, and they took a, a, a conservative view of state general fund revenues. Um, they came back uh, this month, early May, with a revised forecast, and again, that's in accordance with state law. And in that um, early May meeting, they identified 586 million of additional state general fund revenues over the two-year biennium. Um, so that was great news. It was a reflection of, you know, kind of the vaccination process to date, revenues to date, and a revised forecast um, um, that they approved and then submitted to the governor. And that governs how much money the legislature has to appropriate for their two-year budget. So that was the first kind of domino that fell earlier this month. Um, and then, um, you know, the big question is how, how is the legislature planning to use that additional $586 million of monies? And I'm happy to report that the legislature last week on Tuesday and Wednesday took action to appropriate most of that money for K through 12. So that was our hope, um, and it has occurred um, as the Joint Budget Committee, the Senate Finance and Assembly Ways and Means Committees approved the allocation of those dollar amounts you see on your screen. And so that has actually now gone into the K through 12 funding bill, that last item on the slide. Um, so we've seen the, the, those amounts appropriated in that funding bill. Uh, that funding bill got a first hearing last night and then gets a hearing by the Senate Finance Committee uh, later today. Um, but there are still a number of moving parts to the budget. Um, there still, for instance, could be additional mandates that are passed on to school districts over the next five days. Potentially, there could be additional revenues identified by the legislature. And although, you know, we're not too hopeful of those being appropriated for K through 12, one never knows, right? Um, in addition to just the, you know, kind of state budget itself, um, we've seen kind of a reversal and, and back to the future for the pupil-centered funding plan. So uh, when we met and to talk about the new funding formula, the funding plan, back in December, we assumed full implementation of the plan. Then in January, the governor, based on limited revenues identified by the uh, Economic Forum in December, proposed partial Im implementation of the pupil-centered funding plan. So now, uh, as of last week and this week, we're, we're back to full implementation of the pupil-centered funding plan. There is enough revenues that the state has now appropriated for K through 12 that they can fully implement the new model and the new funding formula. Um, and they made along the way a number of tweaks to the funding formula as well, most, most of them actually concerning charter schools. Um, and so we are seeing those changes adopted through the K through 12, again, funding bill and also in Senate Bill 439, which was just kind of separate legislation that made 
some technical changes to Senate Bill 543 that enacted the pupil-centered funding plan. So again, lots of changes over the last week or so. So Jeff's going to go over our general fund budget and the other um, funds budgets in a second. Um, but just to kind of lay out to you our approach to this final budget, rather than rush and give you preliminary numbers that might change, um, that might cause some kind of angst and chaos in our system, we've decided to uh, submit a final budget to you that's based on a, a full implementation scenario, but numbers that were given to us prior to last week. Um, so uh, the numbers from last week look a little better, we think, than what we were previously provided. So. Um, we, th we think this is the prudent course um, to give you numbers we had. Um, again, we were finalizing the final budget over, you know, since early May. And rather than, again, rush and make changes that, again, could change in the next five days, this was the approach we used. So, again, as Madam President um, talked about, um, the approach here, and this is very common for odd-numbered years, is to submit a final budget based on what we know or knew when we were preparing the final budget and then actually getting the final budget and submitting an adjusted or amended final budget in June. That was not a drop the mic moment. That's late. That's later. Great. Thank you. Uh oh. So we just need to. Okay. So we just need to. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, you know, again, it's not an ideal situation, of course, for us or you, the board, to make decisions on kind of this preliminary final budget, if that's a oxymoron. But again, we think it's the prudent course. Um, and, and we do appreciate the legislature's actions, so by no means do I want anyone to misunderstand and believe that we're being dismissive or not acknowledging um, the allocation of more than $500 million for kindergarten through 12 grades last week and this week by the legislature. Um, even though a lot of that was restoration of cuts during this special session last year, it's still a, a significant amount and a, and a really positive decision they made over the last week and a half. Um, so I did want to acknowledge it. It doesn't mean we're saying that wasn't important and that won't benefit Washoe County School District. We just have to go with kind of the numbers we had prior to those actions. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff Bazo, our budget director, to go through our final budget. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. For the record, Jeff Bazo, budget director. Uh, so I will go over the final budget review as Mark stated. Uh, so this slide here is comparing our FY22 revenues under the partial and full implementation of the people-centered funding plan. So under the tentative budget, we assume partial implementation. Under the final budget, we assume uh, full implementation of the people-centered funding plan. So as you can see in this top section here, uh, this is a a summary of revenues that changed due to the move from partial to full implementation. So the, our major local revenue, so ad valorem or property tax, local school support tax, franchise tax, and government services tax are now directed to the state education fund instead of coming directly to the school district. Uh, we also no longer have the distributive school account in state revenues and instead have the state education fund and as you can see here, the net change to the general fund revenues under the pupil-centered funding plan changed to full implementation is a reduction of $5.7 million. So moving into this next slide, this is a summary of how we achieved a structurally balanced budget for the final budget. Again, this first row here shows the reduction of $5.7 million in revenues. Uh, we did have one revenue adjustment that we discussed with you all during the tentative budget presentation, and that was to increase our indirect cost revenue in the general fund uh, for the federal stimulus funding we'll be receiving, and that was $2 million. For our cost-saving adjustments, uh, we had 
uh, under the people, the full implementation of the people-centered funding plan, uh, it looks like there's an adjustment to how special ed dollars flow through to charter schools. So instead of flowing through uh, our school district, they would go directly to the charter schools. So that's a cost savings of about 900000 900, uh, The next line item here is a shift of uh, gifted and talented and EL positions to stimulus funding uh, based on decisions the board had made uh, back in, I think it was the March 9th board meeting um, for changes in gifted and talented and EL programming. Those are positions that are slated to end after FY22. So we've shifted those to stimulus funding uh, for FY22. Also at the tentative budget presentation, uh, you had approved uh, adding about $1.2 million to the general fund for our ESP positions, uh, summer unemployment benefit costs that we might have this upcoming uh, summer. So we shifted those over to stimulus funding. Uh, we had other minor adjustments. And then lastly, we had a reduction to our general fund contingency budget of a million dollars. That was a, a total cost savings adjustment of $3.7 million. That, in addition to the $2 million in increased revenues, balanced the final budget. So this slide here, this shows a summary of the changes to our revenues, our expenses, our transfers out in contingency. And as you can see, we have a balanced budget um, and our fund balance is still about $45.3 million. And Vice President Collins, I'm gonna pause for a minute, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And so I just wanna make sure I have this right. The significant swings in local and state revenues is because we went from partial implementation to full implementation. Could you go over what the 7.6 million remaining in local revenues is? Because I thought all rec local revenues got absorbed by the state. So if you could cover that, that'd be great. Absolutely. So Trustee Cottle, that's a combination of $2 million. That's uh, the indirect cost revenue from uh, stimulus funding. We have other indirect cost revenue, some salary and benefit reimbursements, um, field trip reimbursements, rental income, uh, investment earnings, and several other uh, minor local revenues that make up that amount. Perfect, thank you. And I have it right that the significant shifts are because of partial implementation of full implementation? That is correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So moving on to the next slide, uh, here's a chart showing our, our fund balance uh, and percentage of expenses and transfers out over uh, the last several years. And as you can see, uh, this FY22 budget here shows that we're at 8.7% of ending fund balance. Any questions on the general uh, fund? Before I, I do have a question. Is that where we want to be? Yes, board policy is a minimum of eight to ten percent. Okay, so thought so. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to our other funds. So the first uh, group of funds here are special revenue funds. Uh, so this is a table similar to what we presented at the tentative budget, which was our special ed fund, uh, along with our new weighted funding uh, categories and our other special revenue funds. Uh, this doesn't include any S or three money at this time. This next slide here goes over the major changes to our special revenue funds. Uh, so as I went over in a previous slide, the methodology for uh, charter schools receiving their special ed funds uh, under the full implementation of the people-centered funding plan, we believe special ed funds will go directly to the charter schools and not fl flow through our district. Uh, so that was a decrease of about $875,000. Uh, we also had a realignment of special ed costs between uh, our special ed funds that include our state special education fund and our Medicaid fund. Uh, so by shifting about $347,000 worth of cost from our state special ed fund to the Medicaid fund, uh, it reduced the costs in the state special ed fund and increased them in the Medicaid fund on the general fund side. Uh, the transfer to the state special education account was 
reduced by the 347,000 and then increased into the Medicaid fund. So there's no net impact to the general fund. Uh, for the gifted and talented and English learners weighted funding here, those were the, the shift of those costs that are slated to end at the end of FY22 over to stimulus funding. And then this last item here, uh, we now show the student activities fund uh, as a special revenue fund per uh, GASB 84. Um, that shows sources of $13.6 million um, and we'll be coming to you on the 8th with a little more explanation on that. So the next slide here is internal service funds. Uh, the only change we had to, to these numbers here are um, for the workers' compensation fund. If you recall, during the tentative budget, we increased the workers' compensation rate to be able to add about $500,000 in revenue to the workers' compensation fund. Moving on to the capital projects fund, uh, the major change here was a transfer from the debt service fund to our property tax capital projects fund in the amount of $1.3 million uh, as part of the district's uh, strategic technology plan. One of the funding sources to re, um, refresh devices is to transfer funds from debt service. Um, that's the amount of property tax in excess of our debt service payments up to $4 million plus interest earnings over to this fund to help pay for the refresh program. So that's the only change here on the capital projects fund. Moving to the debt service fund, the only change is the other side of that $1.3 million transfer where we're transferring the $1.3 million from the debt service fund to the, that capital projects fund. And lastly, we have the district's enterprise fund or the nutrition services fund. Uh, this has been updated for uh, projections for next year, uh, which would result in a, ca a projected cash position of about $8.5 million at the end of FY22. And that concludes the other funds. Are there any questions? No, I don't see any, so why don't we... Go ahead and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Any questions on those funds? Anyone? No? Nope. Go ahead. Let's go keep on going. Thank okay. you, Jeff. Uh, so now we're going to look at the next steps and timeline. So we have some unknowns and possible increases heading into the amended final budget. Um, Mark had explained some of the legislative changes that could still happen, um, including the final results of the K-12 through funding bill. As we talked about at our budget update in April, uh, there's still uh, the potential for a possible special, special session this summer for allocating the state stimulus funding. Uh, we also have school reopening plans and possible enrollment changes. Uh, to, so to summarize what's happened to enrollment so far this year, uh, our average daily enrollment has dropped by 583 students uh, from the first quarter of the school year through the third quarter of the school year. Our FY22 budget currently assumes the average daily enrollment of all three quarters of the 61,300 students. And uh, this last part here is that we continue to see charter school expansion. So we have the Coral Academy expansion. I think that was 325 students. And there's you know, uh, other expansions at our current charter schools in this area. And lastly here, uh, in the tentative budget, we had assumed a 15% increase in the insurance rate for our property and casualty premiums, but it looks like that will be closer to 26%, which is an additional $400,000. So this slide here I have a is... Oh. Go ahead, Trustee. Can you go back? Yeah, there we are. So this is concerning um, enrollment has dropped. Is it continuing to drop? I'm trying to interpret that enrollment changes. Thank you for your question, Trustee Church. Uh, so yeah, uh, typically the pattern we see from the beginning of school to the end of school um, is a drop in average daily enrollment. Um, so this trend is similar to previous years, um, but when looking at it at a grade by grade level, 
uh, it's mostly secondary students where we're seeing the reduction. So it's not uncommon. It's not necessarily COVID. This happens all the time as parents move or whatever. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Uh, so in qu uh, quarter two, we usually see a slight uptick, which we didn't see this year. But in quarters three and four, our average daily enrollment does decrease. And then we're predicting, we won't know. I think we all know we won't know until enrollment starts. But we're predicting roughly the same next year as we have today. Correct. Okay. I think that's the most conservative way to do it, which would, although it may not, we know this is with the trend, but to be safe, it's better to start low and then end up in a better position. So I, I, I certainly, that's, that's what I'm hearing that you're presenting to us. That's correct. Okay, yeah, I just I just wanted to have time to, to dwell on that and kind of digest it. Thank you. Have you digested? Is it down? <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's, let's, let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. So this last slide here is for uh, the remaining timeline uh, for this, this budget season. Um, so the legislative session is scheduled to end May 31st. Uh, we'll file this final budget uh, by June 8th. And then we will come back on June 22nd with an amended final budget based on all the final developments of the legislative session. Vice President Caudill. Thank you, Madam President. I personally have always really appreciated how, how you all advise us through the budget process. And so I just want to share my appreciation. The only question I have is you might not have the answer to it. Did the state ever define at risk and what that funding weight looks like? Thank you, Vice President Connell. I'll answer that. Yeah. So um, th this, is, this has been one of those windy roads um, as the legislatures looked at this issue. Um, originally, at risk was defined or, or equated to those on free, those on free and reduced lunch. Um, the Commission on School Funding drilled pretty hard down on that issue and recommended a different measure uh, that was based on a multitude of factors collected in the infinite campus system. And so that was our recommendation is that um, it wouldn't be kind of based just on FRL. Um, that uh, the legislature has chosen to go in a different direction. Right now, the allocations are based on FRL, but they've directed the commission to relook at what the definition of at risk is. So that's something we will do. But I, I believe, and Jeff can, can confirm, that the budget allocations they've made are based on FRL, each district's FRL population. That is correct. So it sounds like that's still kind of TBD, and that'll probably impact this quite a bit, depending on how they define at risk. It, it will, and, and, and one of the issues in using FRL is you cannot identify the, because of federal guidelines, you cannot identify the FRL student at each school. So it's great that allocations, funding allocations are based on that, but I actually can't use that or, or we can't use that in the district to then allocate it down to each school, which is the whole point of the people-centered funding plan, that funding follows the student. So we've got to figure it out. Um, it looks like the allocations have been set in the K through 12 funding bill that was again heard last night, but there will probably be a reallocation of those resources based on whatever NDE eventually uses to identify at risk students. And one follow up, isn't the whole district on free and reduced lunch next year? So it's not, that doesn't impact this. It's if, if you would have qualified if it wasn't blanket. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's why I make sure I right. have that right because the whole district's on FRL and that's what they're basing it off of. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Caudill. Trustee Church. So, if I heard, first of all, I, this is way above my pay grade, so we are so thankful to have you here. I'm not even going to pretend to understand it totally, but is this going to come? We're going to hear more on June 8th or not till June 22nd? Do we know? I, th I think we'll get it. I don't know if they'll be ready June 8th. I would, I would anticipate that. I think it's going to be more like 
June 22nd, okay. Yeah, it, it will be June 22nd. That'll give us time with Lindsay Anderson's help to look at all the bills that were passed and signed by the governor, because again, the governor can veto legislation, but we'll look at all the legislation that's passed and been signed, again, to verify whether there's any mandates that we need to fund, which has happened in, the, in recent years, um, as well as just re-review, make sure there haven't been any monetary changes um, past you know, in the, in the waning hours of the session, which again can happen. Yeah. And then, if I see right, again, trying to get my, trying to get an understanding of this, we've, we've funds moved some funds into the CARES, into the CARES Act, Act or, the federal, or funding. the federal funding, such as the gate gifted. That's extremely important to me. Um, so I think what I'm hearing, if you can just verify, come 2023, we're going to have to grapple with that funding. So specifically for gifted and talented, what we're doing is phasing down or pacing uh, a number of reductions to that GT administrative staff. If you remember the, the, the meeting in March that we talked about, there were a number of staff in the administrative area that were identified for a future reduction, say in year two or three. So while that position is still funded in fiscal year 22, we'll use stimulus funding later be deleted out of the budget entirely. So it creates that phasing down that we want. Thank you, Trustee Church, and thank you, Mr. Mather. Any other questions, comments? Um, the, the work that you've done in such an uncertain, such a, a year of such uncertainty, I would say from a budgetary standpoint, um, um, it's really, really appreciated as I already expressed. You make it some easier to understand the budget, which is, you know, close to a billion dollars. And certainly we appreciate all the work um, of the, the, the team in Carson City led by Lindsay to continue to, to keep us in the best position possible to, uh, to weather some of these um, as, they, as they come up. So if no other questions, are, are I see Vice President Call. I think you're ready for a motion. I am. Thank you, sir. I move the Board of Trustees approves the final budget for fiscal year 21-2021-22 for the Washoe County School District. Thank you, Vice President Caldwell. There's a second by uh, Clerk Manetto. Actually, Any... actually, Madam President, could we open the public hearing? Oh, I forgot all about that. First. Thank you. You reminded yes. me of it and then I forgot. Okay, thank you. Why don't we officially open the public hearing on the budget because we certainly need to do that before we submit our final <laughs> budget, if you can say that. So the budget hearing is officially open. Okay, on that, let me, let me make... How about that? That's real official. <laughs> okay, that's when I do this. That's that's official. Yes, JJ. You'll need to call for public comment. I was just I was gonna thank you for thank you for the reminder. But we will. I, I knew that part. That thank you. Are, is there uh, are there budget specific public comments on this, JJ? I have no public comment related to this item. Okay, thank you very much. And so we do. Do we take the motion during the public hearing, or do we close the public hearing? Okay. All right. The the public hearing is now officially closed. Okay, thank you. Now we will go back, if we may, then to, if you want to do that first, to we'll go back to the motion, please, Trustee Call, Vice President Call. I move with the Board of Trustees approves the final budget for fiscal year 2021-22 for the Washoe County School District. Thank you, Vice President Caudill. And I see the, the same nod and hand of uh, for a second from Clerk Manado. Manado any discussion? Uh, Trustee Thigpen, we don't want to leave you out, so please jump in, sir, if you have any comments during this time. I'm good. I think the staff did a great job of covering everything and answering the questions I have. So I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much, Trustee Thigpen. Okay, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to accept the 21 22 uh, final budget, uh, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Opposition? Oh, thank you. I almost cut you off. Thank you. Ah. All right, any opposition? Okay, the motion's carry. Let the record show that it is unanimous. Thank you again for, for all the work in such a crazy year. And I'm just really proud to be a part of this board that once again, uh, we approved a balanced budget. So great work, great work. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, before we end the work session, we know we'll begin our board meeting at 2 p.m. We're gonna call for any public comment for, for the work session. I have no cards for this item. Okay, thank you very much and seeing none, then um, we will stand uh, dismissed. We will stand dismissed until uh, for the work session. And then at 2 p.m. We, we will begin a regular meeting 
of the Washington County School District Board of Trustees. Thank you so much, everybody.